Hello and welcome back to this uh, workshop number four on the maritime spatial planning uh, towards uh, good environmental status. Uh, my name is Jan schmidt Krona, and I will be moderating this uh, session. I work at the Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management and uh, uh, this session has been produced uh, by uh, Helcom. Uh, I, I'd like my second slide, perhaps, if I can ask. Uh, there we have it. Uh, yes, um, I will start with a short introduction. Uh, first, actually, about uh, my background in this. Uh, I have been taking part as one of the uh, Swedish MSP uh, team members since uh, 2012. Uh, and there you see the pro MSP process in Sweden on your left side. Uh, I have been responsible for the impact assessment procedures, where you might know that we worked with a tool called uh, Symphony, where we have... Uh, uh, this is a picture showing how we have compared different scen planning scenarios uh, to uh, evaluate uh, environmental impacts uh, at the uh, MSP planning level. Uh, and Symphony can be used to, to pr produce these uh, uh, chord diagrams, which you see uh, below, where you have the different pressures from sectors affecting a, a number of different uh, ecosystem components. And we have also used Symphony to develop uh, green infrastructure maps. And in Swedish MSP, we have actually uh, included uh, designated areas, so-called small N areas for uh, and for nature in the uh, plans uh, as an addition to, to the established marine uh, protected areas. Uh, I have also been involved in uh, quite a lot of work on uh, ecosystem approach tools or EBA tools in uh, the, the Baltic Scope project and the Pan-Baltic Scope project and also related to the Helcom Bossab group. Uh, and today we will touch upon, uh, I think, a number of these issues, uh, how, how MSP relates to, to EBA. And I'm going to show you a, a picture which is, uh, I've used it uh, quite a lot. It's an old picture, but I still think it's relevant, showing that uh, integrating uh, good environmental status or environmental consideration into MSP is about linking the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, the MSFD, to the uh, MSP, uh, the planning. And that's a relationship. And the relationship, it should be uh, a loving relationship. And uh, the core of that loving relationship uh, should be as I see it, the good environmental status, to actually be able to communicate that in the relationship as a link between MSFD and MSP. And the, to get a bit more concrete, you can see that you need to uh, uh, look at the descriptors, criteria and targets and indicators of the MSFD as a way of communicating the content of, of the the guess heart, as I call it. And it's a simple way to remember it. Uh, we have this Roxette song, Listen to Your Guess Heart. Uh, it goes like this. Uh, Listen to your guess heart when it's calling for you. And uh, at this point, we might think if we actually are, are having a, a loving relationship. So... Uh, th because there's another guess, uh, another Roxette song, uh, the one, uh, it must have been love, but it's over now. Uh, it must have been good environmental status, but I lost it somehow. We don't want the planners to think uh, that. So, uh, sorry, I have to. So I think today we'll deal a bit about the relationship. Uh, between the MSFD and the uh, MSP practice. 
uh, as we have the first workshop theme to uh, to look at uh, the Helcom uh, Baltic Sea Action Plan and also the regional MSP roadmap. Uh, Rüdiger from from Helcom has already uh, elaborated a bit on that, uh, but uh, we'll. Uh, uh, get some more in-depth uh, information. Another theme of today is the ecosystem-based approach in MSP, and uh, also looking a bit broader on on the biodiversity strategy, uh, how that will relate to to MSP uh, in the future. Straightforward questions: uh, How can MSP, based on EBA, contribute to achieve good environmental status? And the second question is, what is the role of MSP in the implementation of the biodiversity strategy? And as a participant to this workshop, you're also able to, to discuss the, these questions and in the, at the, in the platform uh, with each other during the workshop. Okay, so now uh, we move into the presentation part. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Dmitry Kamenetsky uh, at Helcom, uh, who took the post as a professional secretary in the Helcom Secretariat in 2014. Uh, and he has been responsible for the Helcom Vasab MSP group uh, since then. And one of the major achievements uh, was the coordination of the development of the regional guideline for the implementation of the ecosystem-based approach in MSP, and also the guidelines on transboundary MSP output data structure in the Baltic Sea. And uh, Dimitri will talk about the renewed effort toward good environmental status of the Baltic Sea and the BSAP update and new regional MSP roadmap. So Dimitri, the floor is yours. Super. Well, and the Baltic Sea Action Plan, which I have just recently presented, I identify the overarching goal as healthy body sea environment with diverse biological components, resulting in a good environmental status and also supporting vibration of sustainable economic and social activities. Uh, the current still valid body sea action plan uh, was adopted in 2007. And it includes four uh, components, uh, eutrophication, hazardous substances, biodiversity, and maritime, maritime activities. But it does say nothing about maritime specialty. Uh, probably, but not completely, I hope. That was the reason why, actually, the goals of the current Baltic Action Plan have not been achieved. So then this uh, uh, simple visualization over um, the um, status of the Baltic Sea in red-green color scheme uh, shows that dominating color is still red, indicating that most of the indicators uh, or mo most of the uh, parameters are indicating uh, not good environmental status of the sea. Uh, come on. What are the reasons for that? Yes. Uh, what are the reasons for that? The reasons are, mm, there, there is a number of reasons. There are objective reasons, such as, for example, natural uh, ecosystem lack, so it does respond immediately on um, implemented measures. Some measures may be, haven't been implemented, some measures might be inefficient, uh, and also new challenges emerge. But again, probably we simply didn't apply some of the available instruments or some of the available tools. And this and one of these tools supposed to be maritime special play. Uh, that is why the structure of the uh, new Baltic Sea Action Plan, which is, in general is uh, 
almost the same as the previous one. Uh, I should make a small remark in the beginning that this is not or accepted by the Section Plan, a new, new uh, not, not adopted by the Section Plan. What we are speaking about now is a draft. So, but anyway, the structure is, uh, of the new draft is almost the same. It is, so to say, evolution, but not revolution. We are not making something revolutionary new. But anyway, uh, being very, so much resembling the uh, structure of the previous action plan, it has this fifth um, section, which called horizontal actions. It means actions which uh, support all four segments, main segments, which I have already mentioned previously, and which you can see on this screen. Uh, one of the topics among those horizontal actions is maritime special planning. And this is uh, the beginning of the story about concrete commitments which support love between MSP and good environmental status, uh, which Jan um, presented in the very beginning. Uh, how does Baltic Sea Action Plan recognize the American special thing? Uh, Beside the overarching statement that maritime special planning applied by existing based approach should be coherent and they need, we need them to be developed, established and uh, implemented, Baltic Action Plan recognized maritime special planning firstly as an instrument for integrated management of sea-based human activity and thus as an instrument which uh, capable to reduce various, uh, the environmental pressure on various components of the environment. Also, uh, the Baltic Sea Action Plan considers marine special planning as a tool which uh, uh, takes into account, uh, so to say, um, special perspective of those human activities. And finally, since maritime special planning uh, is doomed to uh, support sustainable development and recalling the definition of sustainable development as economic growth without increasing uh, pressure on the environment. This is indeed a valuable instrument for achieving the goals of the Baltic Sea Action Plan. But this is more or less theory. How does it look in practice? how from the Baltic Sea Action Plan point of view, maritime special planning is able to contribute. Um, first of all, it can signal areas of high natural value and inform all developers that, hello guys, there is something which wouldn't be, which you would probably not touch upon. And then uh, it can also having this information steer human activities away from such uh, sensitive or valuable areas. On the other hand, uh, Baltic Sea Action Plan commits itself that uh, there is a need to establish a system of maritime protected areas, as well as our supporting uh, measures. To also, it should map ecosystem services for indeed how we can steer activities if we don't know where there is uh, these valuable areas or uh, sensitive ecosystem components. And finally, uh, that is commitment for all of us to incorporate all this information into narrative special plans. Uh, Baltic Section Plan can't live alone. It lives in a uh, friendly uh, surround, uh, surrounding of uh, associated documents, which are more specific and technical than public action plan itself. And one of these uh, documents is a regional MSP roadmap. This is the second version of the Baltic's original roadmap. The first one was. Uh, designed for seven year period and now 
the new uh, roadmap, which is not completely adopted. As far as I know, there it is adopted by BASA, but it is still under consideration by Helcom. Uh, this is designed for 10 years and covering the, the same period as Marvin Section. And actually, the uh, focus of the new uh, roadmap uh, significantly differs. So this is also a step, evolutionary step forward. If the first one was focused on the development of maritime and establishing over maritime expansion plans, now we're speaking about implementation and building knowledge base for the new site. And of course, uh, among the objectives of the roadmap, uh, maritime special planners uh, couldn't um, miss uh, mentioning uh, good environmental status and achievement over goals of the Baltic Sea Action Plan. But this is only one out of five objectives, which means that uh, maritime special planning definitely contributes and works together in close cooperation with the Baltic Sea Action Plan, but this is one of the goals, not a single uh, target. Um, so also um, roadmap includes a good number of more concrete actions, uh, how to achieve this objective. And as you can see, so this, these are uh, measures which are very closely related to what Baltic Sea Action Plan says. It includes uh, identification of uh, maritime special planning and um, other effective ferry based conservation measures, uh, assessment of for cumulative environmental and, uh, impact, and many other. So, also uh, using common data assessment methods and, uh, and so on. So, uh, actually, this is more specific uh, description of what. Uh, was said in the Baltic Sea Action Plan and more focused on planners. So with that, uh, not lingering long on this presentation, uh, I would try to draw some conclusions. Uh, first of all, that it seems like uh, we uh, yeah, the, the first, of course, that for the goal of, my, uh, of the previous roadmap has been achieved, and we now have almost all countries uh, designed the um, American special plans. Uh, so the the new goal over roadmap is building. Uh, sound basis for new cycle. We can say that MSP now in the Baltic Sea region uh, well recognized and recognized by the Baltic Sea Action Plan as a tool to achieve good, one of the tools to achieve good environmental status of the Baltic Sea, but not, uh, yeah, of course, uh, they say uh, maritime special planning is able just to contribute that, so it's not capable to solve all problems. Uh, of course, we should recognize that maritime special planning is pursuing uh, other goals, but not only achieving good environmental status. And that uh, Baltic Sea Action Plan and the uh, regional roadmap are designed as a coherent document, contributing to each other and supporting each other's goals and objectives. But this is the best, uh, the, the favorite word of our uh, Health and Information Secretary. He always say that we have achieved a lot, so it is so well done, and uh, send positive message, but then, but. We still need to work further, and we need to work practically. So what have been presented here, uh, what has been presented here is more or less uh, a theory, but now we are at the stage when we should work on the and develop the concrete measures, concrete steps, and uh, concrete actions um, in order to achieve um, ambitious goals for both public section plan and the roadmap. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much, Dimitri. Uh, due to the technical problems, we, we are not able to have any 
questions at this, po this point, but I think we can agree that it's uh, really valuable that a lot of effort has been put in both the uh, integration of MSP in the BSAP and as well uh, in the development of the new regional roadmap. So, and perhaps we can discuss the, the role of that and how important it actually is. Uh, and now we move on to uh, Vanessa Ryan, and I'm very glad that you can uh, participate as a representative of an environmental NGO, uh, WWF Finland. And Vanessa works as a marine conservation officer at uh, WWF, and she is a marine biologist. Uh, and what will her focus is work focused broadly on marine policy and its implementation. She also works hands on with oil spill response and oil wildlife response. So really practical stuff, uh, not only MSP. Uh, and Vanessa, you will speak about the ecosystem-based uh, ecosystem maritime spatial planning in Europe and how to assess it. Uh, so please, uh, Vanessa. Yes, thank you very much, Jan, for the introductions and happy to be here today and discuss MSP and ecosystem-based maritime spatial planning with all of you. And I will also try and see if my uh, app for changing the slides uh, works. So hopefully you can bear with me and see that it will all uh, work out. Um, first of all, I will just introduce what I'm going to talk, uh, talk to you about today. So I will go briefly through the background uh, information on what we mean by ecosystem-based approach in MSP. Uh, and then after that, I will briefly introduce a methodology for assessing uh, marine spatial plans and whether they, they actually are ecosystem based uh, or not. So let's see if it works, this slide changer. Yes, perfect. Okay, so a bit of background. Um, you can do a quick uh, Google search and what you will come up with uh, when you Google the state of the oceans is some of the headlines we see here on the left. Uh, so all is not well with our oceans. And the examples you see here are just a few uh, that you can get by, you know, putting in a few search words in Google and you will find uh, them in the, all the ma major newspapers in the world. And of course, the two major threats uh, that our oceans are facing um, are the huge challenges of biodiversity loss um, and the climate crisis. And these two are, of course, as we know, very tightly wound together. And the fact is that our marine areas are not uh, sustainably managed. You can't say that for virtually any uh, marine area of the world. And if you look at some facts and figures, uh, we can say that only around 13% of the world's oceans can be regarded uh, as wilderness, so areas where human uh, uh, effects are, are minimized, uh, and less than 8% are covered by marine protected areas. Uh, and when we look into uh, strictly protected areas and properly managed marine protected areas, then the number again significantly drops, so to around 3% uh, protected. So those are the challenges uh, we are faced with. Uh, I think that I just skipped one of my slides. I have to go back and see. Sorry for that. Let's see if it goes. No? Okay. We'll work with this. So more than about a third of the world's human population lives less than 100 kilometers from the coast, um, and that makes around 2.5 billion people. And, and this, of course, translates into large pressure on the marine environment uh, in coastal areas. And that's clear if you look at Europe's seas as well. And you can look at the image on the left there uh, is taken from the EEA's 2021 briefing, Europe's marine biodiversity remains under pressure. And here you can see that really an overwhelming proportion of our coastal areas are in moderate uh, to bad condition. And uh, marine spatial planning is all usually and often seen as a, a solution for this uh, poor management of, of marine areas and, and should really deliver to the three pieces that you can see in the pie in the picture. So we have social factors, we have economy and we have the environment. Uh, however, the environment is often the one that is compromised when all these three factors are balanced against, against each other. And it's really important to remember that the ecosystem services um, that the marine environment provides kind of forms the basis of this pie. So the bottom of the pie and the pie wouldn't hold together with all, without all these ecosystem services that the environment provides. 
So, for example, um, if we want to work on the environment uh, slice of the pie, we can designate an MPA to protect seagrass meadows, um, which would meet the concerns of the environment. But then again, if the water quality isn't good enough, then the seagrass meadows won't thrive. We can designate fishing zones to support the economic uh, activities, so the economy slice of the pie, but if uh, the fish stocks aren't in good condition, they won't deliver. And we can designate uh, places for tourism to thrive, for, for beach use, etc., which would feed into the social factors uh, slice of the pie, but if those beaches are in bad condition, if there are algae blooms, you won't you won't uh, reach the goals that you wanted to reach uh, for social factors. So that is why uh, marine spatial planning needs to be ecosystem-based, obviously, uh, and we need to manage 100% of our seas sustainably, uh, not only the 30% that, that we should designate as marine protected areas. But what do we mean by ecosystem-based and how does that uh, translate into concrete actions? Uh, this uh, text in the slide is taken from our position paper, Achieving Ecosystem-Based Marine uh, Spatial Plans, which is from 2020. And there are three kind of important points here that define what we see as ecosystem-based MSP. The first one of those would be that the carrying capacity, that it acknowledges that the carrying capacity of marine ecosystems against human pressures is finite. So you cannot uh, add pressures uh, without it having an effect. The second one is that the marine space is an integrated system uh, and it provides a variety of uses and services, including marine protection. So this in practice should translate into reduced pressures on the environment and reserving enough space for nature in those uh, marine spatial plans. And the third one, of course, is that MSP is transversal, so it cuts uh, across different sectoral policies. Well, let's see, that worked again. So uh, how do we assess marine spatial plans and whether they actually deliver and are ecosystem based or not? Um, and uh, as a first thought, um, I want to lift out that it is actually an obligation for the European Commission to deliver a report uh, on the implementation of the directive within the first year of the plan's publication, uh, and therefore to evaluate the, the kind of designating and designing phase uh, of member states' uh, MSP work. And as a matter of fact, uh, assessing the marine spatial plans before they are implemented uh, is vital in order to answer a couple of very important questions. Uh, and those are, are we on the right track? Uh, will the marine spatial plans contribute to reaching the goal of good environmental status or not? And then uh, has there been transparency during the drafting period and has feedback from the public consultations been taken into account? And that also refers to what Kasten was talking about earlier on. Uh, do the public consultations actually lead to a change in the plans or not? Uh, the question is, of course, how will it be possible to assess the plans uh, and what could be the mythology, methodology for doing so? So how do we turn the requirements of uh, the Marine Spatial Planning Directive uh, into measurable assessment indicators? Yes, that worked as well. So there are key principles and criteria that are required uh, to, deli to deliver on an ecosystem-based approach to MSP, and those have been put forward in our position paper that I mentioned earlier on. Uh, and the paper introduces specific measures uh, related to conservation, transparency and governance, monitoring, enforceability and funding that should be found in all ecosystem based uh, marine spatial plans. Analyzing the maritime spatial planning directives content uh, through the lens of, of these planning principles show that many of the directives prov provisions uh, contrib actually contribute to achieving an ecosystem based approach to MSP. So the MS, uh, the Marine Spatial Planning Directive uh, thematic provisions that have been identified as participating to achieving uh, ecosystem-based MSP are listed on this slide uh, and the following slide that I have. So um, they are actually presented as the black headings that you can see here. So land sea interactions, which is Article 7, thriving nature, which is Articles 3, 5, 6 and 8, sustainable blue economy, Articles 3, 5 and 6 uh, and so forth. So those are the, the thematic provisions that would participate to achieving ecosystem-based uh, MSP. And there are more uh, coming on the next slide here. You can see public participation, data and knowledge, cross-border cooperation and competent authorities. And then under these thematic provisions, a number of planning phase deliverables have been identified. Um, 
and these deliverables could be all be used as, as indicators to assess uh, the marine spatial plans. And these indicators you can see as the white text under the black headings. And I won't go through them all because I simply do not have the time for it, but I have a link uh, to this methodology and the report uh, on my last slide so you can familiarize yourselves uh, with them after the presentation. So once we have uh, a set of indicators, uh, there needs to be some sort of easy to use scoring system by which we can actually grade uh, what countries are doing and what they're doing well and what they're not performing on. And some sort of uh, user friendly way to visualize the results of these assessments. And I've just taken an example here, um, what it could look like. Uh, the visual visualization could be similar to, to the picture that you see here on the left hand side. Um, and this is the WWF UK's uh, so-called compass card, uh, which they use to assess marine protected areas management. So the indicators you see on the list there on the right side of the picture are actually only uh, regarding marine protected areas and are not uh, related to MSP, but something similar could be done for MSP and the indicators that we've identified. So using a, this kind of a, a compass card would make it very easy to visualize and and scores can be really readily seen and compared. So uh, how it works is uh, you start from the middle of the circle there um, and the higher you score on something, the further out on the circle it goes. So you start from zero in the very middle uh, and go out to basically how many scores you want to give. So you could give on a scale from zero to three or zero to four. Uh, whichever way you prefer to, to make that assessment. And here is just a, a suggestion at the top could be, you know, not achieved a score of zero, partly achieved a score of 0 0.5 or, or yes, achieved a score of one, etc. So you could, uh, and of course the goal is to be as far out on the circle as possible. And then it's easy to visualize and see and compare actually the results between different uh, countries. So taking a similar approach to assessing the maritime spatial plans of different countries could give us a, a good overview of where the different countries are on the scale of achieving ecosystem-based maritime spatial planning. And that was a very, very quick overview. I hope that you will all take the time to, to um, participate in the discussions. And if you want more information, please send me an email and I will send you uh, the report and the assessment methodology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa. Uh, personally, I think that uh, WWF, uh, you're doing a great job uh, addressing MSPs specifically, and that uh, it's important to actually provide uh, simple tools to, to MSP practitioners to, to use to simplify uh, this uh, ecosystem-based uh, approach in MSP. It shouldn't be possible to, to just say that you, you, you don't know what, how to do it. So uh, it's very valuable. Uh, I think we move on now to the last uh, speakers or the last presentations, which uh, uh, Panina Blanket and Enrico Variapuro will uh, present. And I'll present you both. Uh, Panina works at the Finnish Ministry of the Environment as a ministerial advisor, and her responsibilities are matters related to the protection of the marine and nature in both national and international contexts. Uh, she has been working there for uh, almost 25 years and is uh, participating both in the uh, Helcom Vasab MSP workgroup and in the Helcom uh, State and Conservation Group. Uh, which is a quite unique uh, posi position, an important position, I'd say, uh, to link these two groups in one person. Uh, Rico, on the other hand, uh, leads the unit of sustainable use of the marine areas at the Finnish Environment Institute, Syke. And he's uh, focusing, uh, working with social science research with a special focus on the practices of decision making and planning. And he has also been working with MSP for quite a while now. And he's uh, one of the members of the MSP Global Expert Group that's uh, updating the IOC UNESCO's guidance document on MSP. And I know that Panina will start uh, and you will present on the topic linkages between the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030 and MSP's spatial implications, for instance, in the 
uh, MPAs. So please, Benina. Yes, thank you, Jan, for these kind words, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Yes, we will have an introduction of the, both of the EU biodiversity, biodiversity strategy 2030, bringing nature back to in our life. And I think we are getting your, your MSFD lover, he's getting some kind of a new target perhaps here also. Let's see. So the uh, next slide. So, as uh, Vanessa already told us, so uh, the biodiversity is in a, it's one of our crises with the climate change. And the state is that biodiversity is essential for our life. Our planet and the economy, everything is dependent on it. And when the nature is healthy, it protects and provides. And at the moment, this, the situation is not like this. We are losing nature like never before because of unsustainable human activities. And the EU biodiversity strategy is an, uh, uh, how do you say, an uh, try to get our back to track again. So next slide, the objective of the biodiversity strategy is to put our Europe's biodiversity on the path to recovery by 2030 for the benefit of people, climate and the planet. And uh, the next one, and how, uh, how is it going to, do, uh, going to be? So the first uh, uh, aim or uh, action is to establish a large EU-wide network of protected areas on land and at sea. So there should be at least 30% of the EU's land and, sea, uh, land and sea areas protected to make an integrated ecological corridors and uh, a true trans-European nature network. And it should also include strictly protected uh, areas, as, uh, at least third of these EU's protected areas should uh, cover, uh, for example, carbon-rich ecosystems such as seagrass meadows, and they should be strictly protected. And we don't need uh, more uh, paper parks, so this should be eff effectively managed, and there should be a, a clear, defined conservation objectives for these areas and measures, and uh, they should be properly monitored also how to achieve these, all these uh, objectives and so on. Next slide. Uh, the other part of the strategy is an uh, EU nature restor restoration plan. So there should, uh, EU is planning to have the commission will propose a binding nature restoration targets by the end of this year. So there should be to restore degraded ecosystems by 2030 and manage them sustainably, addressing the key drivers of biodiversity loss. And next slide, so what are these? There are many uh, of these uh, actions to be done here. So few, uh, um, few examples, so, these are the restoration targets, and especially for carbonist ecosystems, but also uh, we should aim to recover 30% of the uh, state uh, of uh, habitats and species or to change the trend for these. And then there are like uh, marine, uh, these are more marine, uh, indirect uh, related or directly related. Some of these are mainly in terrestrial areas, but they can affect all, also the marine when they are done in the terrestrial part. So these are just uh, some examples, there are more. And the next one, so uh, 
for marine environment, marine ecosystems. The, uh, our targets are to restore and properly protect marine ecosystems. And all illegal practice should, there should be zero tolerance. So all harvests should be sustainable and uh, legal. And here we come, National Maritime Sp Spatial Plan should aim at covering all maritime sectors and activities, as well as, as area-based conservation management measures. So this is one of the link to the MSP. And also there, there are planning to have a new action plan to conserve fishery resources and protect marine ecosystems by 2021. And also there will be some uh, fishing year that are uh, should be limited that are harmful for the biodiversity or also including the seabed. Next. And of course, when we are in the marine environment, so one of the most important uh, uh, in, uh, activities and uh, is the uh, fishing and to have the long-term prosperity for fishermen, the, uh, our fish, fish uh, stocks and uh, fish species should be in a good status. And it's important that maintain or reduce fishing mortality at or under maximum sustainable yield, yield level. So sustainable fishing. And also bycatch is one of the main threats for many threatened uh, species and there should be the aim should be to eliminate or reduce the uh, level of bycatch that allows the full reco recovery for threatened species and in that addition also fishery management measures should be established in all marine protected areas and there should be clearly defined conservation objectives and on the basis available scientific advice. So the next one, so uh, there is a need uh, to have this, we can't do without uh, a proper funding. And uh, so th the strategy highlights the unlocking funding for biodiversity and the motion of a new strengthened governance framework to ensure the be better implementation uh, of this uh, strategy and also that we are tracking the progress. And we need also to improve knowledge and financing and investments and also the chains to have a better respect in nature in public and business decision making. And now it has in the EU strategy it said that uh, there will be unlocked 20 billion e euros per year for biodiversity through various sources. So also EU funds, but also other private and national fundings. So this is how uh, it's hoped that in 2030, the halt of uh, the loss of uh, biodiversity will be halted and we are back in the track for nature. And this is also important for the uh, negotiations that uh, we are going at the moment regarding the uh, CBD uh, post-2020 uh, framework the, for uh, 30, 2030, post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And this is the next uh, slide where uh, Commission has taken a very active role to, in, to engage in these uh, negotiations and to have an ambitious uh, uh, global biodiversity framework. Hopefully already this year in, in uh, October uh, there will be some uh, decision on the uh, uh, in the Conference of Parties to the Convention of Biological Diversity. But these uh, are just ongoing discussions and we hope that the, uh, this framework will be as ambitious as our EU biodiversity strategy. 
So by this, I will give my floor to Rico for our regarding the linkage between this biodiversity strategy and MSP. Please, Rico. Can you unmute yourself? Okay, now, sorry. I have to click two different places. Okay, yes, uh, th thanks for uh, uh, for this opportunity to present uh, here. And, um, and this, um, I'm presenting only this one slide. Uh, we, open a discussion about linkages between uh, the biodiversity strategy and, and MSP. And I hope you didn't um, expect us to give you the definite answer because, I mean, this is, of course, a very much a work in progress uh, as the, the biodiversity strategy for, was uh, uh, approved uh, last December, uh, but the implementation of it is not really defined yet. Uh, and then most of the countries uh, have just finalized or are being finalizing their MSPs. So timing wise, uh, this is a discussion rather for coming next few years to really discuss this this so this topic, which is uh, which we can see uh, that there are some channel challenges, uh, but also opportunities that first point. Uh, I want to raise is that uh, even with the risk of st stating the obvious that uh, that MPAs they are not designated uh, through M MSP processes but they are rather uh, parallel processes that are more or less uh, well uh, integrated in, in different countries um, and this has for instance recently been uh, discussed in a paper by uh, Bruce Trouillet and Stephen Jay in Marine Policy um, uh, compared some some national experiences on this and, and this is by far a simple uh, relationship uh, between these two two processes but then uh, looking more in, into future then well this 30 percent conservation goal is possibly a, a game changer also for the MSP uh, at least for the next planning rounds because well 30 percent obviously it's a lot and uh, and if we think for instance uh, uh, ambitious goals in, in renew renewable energy and, and offshore wind farms and uh, and in for instance in recent study by BMIP the, the Baltic Energy Market Integration Plan and and they foresee the the growth of uh, offshore wind production in the Baltic Sea by 2030 to to be three to six times more than today and uh, and increasing even further from that and so the the, the question of course regarding uh, wind energy is, of course, that how compatible that is. Uh, is it by under any conditions compatible with cons uh, protected area goals or not, or are they mutually exclusive? And then regarding the 10% 10, 10 strict uh, protected areas, that's very ambitious because, uh, of course, um, most countries, uh, some countries have already uh, reached the 30% target with MPAs, but with strictly protected MPAs, at least in the Baltic Sea, we have very little uh, experiences. So that's uh, yeah, that's some business goal. Um, and then obviously, uh, in the future area designations in MSP, they should not contradict with these conservation targets. And, uh, and a further challenge and, uh, and also underlining the importance of M MSP actually here is that uh, uh, the most valuable biodiversity areas are typically in shallow and near shore areas. Um, uh, but so are also many of the other interests too. And so this, this really underlines uh, the, the importance of, of MSP to, to really find these uh, ways to, to combine these different goals and, and, and ambitious. And, um, and uh, well, last point might be that that regarding this last point is that if we really want to implement the biodiversity strategy with high level of ambition, then uh, these near shore areas should be covered uh, quite well because, of course, politically it might be easier to 
to establish MPA somewhere out, very far outside, uh, out, out at sea. Of course, there are some uh, pelagic uh, habitats in, uh, needing protection too, but most of the valu valuable biodiversity areas are near the coastline. So this is just a couple of points uh, for for discussions in coming years and uh, maybe in this panel too. But so I I end here our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Penina and Rico, uh, for giving us more information on the actual content of the biodiversity strategy and and also some uh, some links to to MSP. Uh, and now we start the uh, the panel discussion, and we have twenty minutes for that, or for for the the rest of the uh, workshop. And I'd like to start with uh, asking Caps Vanessa uh, about if you have any comments on the actual contents of the current MSPs, which are being or have been decided upon at this point uh, because we can see look at msp from a kind of procedural perspective including the msp process and the strategy uh, environmental impact assessments uh, but you can also look at it really basically on the contents and uh, enrico you touched upon it uh, in your last uh, uh, slide that if there is if there are contradictions between uh, uh, users in the plans and uh, conservation targets or or the main question is what can be to which extent is environmental considerations uh, included in uh, the the current msps and if not what could be be better uh, addressed in in the future uh, so vanessa perhaps a few uh, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, thank you, Jan. I can just briefly say, obviously, I have not read uh, all the Baltic Sea countries' uh, marine spatial plans. I have not familiarized myself with them, but I think that at this first stage, um, it's it's kind of a, a work in progress, so to speak. Uh, and, and I think that we're really going to have a, a tight deadline here now, uh, looking at the biodiversity strategy, and looking at you know reaching good environmental status by 27, I think that that we really need to step it up uh, with the marine spatial plans as well. We're only now finalizing you know the first round in a lot of countries. Some countries obviously have have done marine spatial planning for a longer period than others, but a lot of countries are actually finalizing their first uh, marine spatial plans uh, and and then going into the kind of cycle of, of adapting it and and getting ready for the next cycle i think we're going to have a really really tough time uh, or we have to be very very ambitious uh, if we want to reach these goals uh, and just looking at, at uh, a couple of examples from the baltic sea uh, countries mainly i will just comment on on finland for example and the marine spatial plan there i think it's great that it has been done and it's it's been a really uh, a process where a lot of stakeholders have been involved, but there is a risk as well that, you know, it's a kind of what we call in Finnish a, a barrel of wishes. So, you know, everyone says what they would like to see, you know, I would like to be here, I would like to be there and making those really tough decisions, you know, telling someone, some sector or, or some developer, you know, you cannot, you cannot touch this area. Uh, is a really tough call and we have to to maybe start making those tough tough decisions uh, and as and looking into for example uh, now we can actually assess the first uh, marine spatial plans of the different countries to see how far are we from reaching for example uh, the the 30 by 30 goal like what is the kind of designations that, that countries have actually put aside uh, for nature protection and how do they overlap with other uh, sectors is really, really important because I think that we will find that a lot of the protected areas are actually uh, in, in, in sectors or in areas where, where a lot of human activity is, is allowed. So re especially reaching that 10% strictly protected is going to be a challenge. Um, yeah, that yeah. was briefly it. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, thank you. So uh, actually, perhaps uh, tougher priorities between users if, uh, which may be a challenge because we have this uh, coexistence ambition uh, in, in many countries and uh, and uh, leaving some uh, idea of leaving issues open to to uh, licensing procedures uh, 
further down. But uh, I think it's a good uh, good comment. So perhaps we need uh, more clear uh, regulations or uh, in uh, designations in uh, in MSP. Could you comment also on issue about carrying capacity? Uh, do you share the the view that uh, there's a need to actually communicate the, the carrying capacity limits? Uh, better to be able to consider it an MSP or or to which extent is that a problem? Yeah, I think it would be important. And I think that the, what Kasten also uh, brought out was the fact that we don't actually, you know, have a, a lot of this information. So just making sure that we, we know, for example, the cumulative impacts that human activities have. There's a lot of information that's lacking there. Uh, having said that, I don't want to say, you know, we cannot make decisions because we are lacking uh, information because now is the time that we actually have to make these tough decisions in a lot of instances. But I think that communicating um, to the different sectors, for example, in the using the marine space and planning to use marine space, you know, communicating clearly what the targets are that we have for the biodiversity strategy for good environmental status and making them kind of owners of the process and, and making them actively contribute to these environmental goals that we have, not only, you know, their own sectoral goals that they might have for growth and for employment, et cetera, et cetera, but making them owners uh, of the environmental goals as well uh, would be really important. Thank you. Um, Dimitri, uh, you uh, uh, showed us this uh, policy framework, uh, both the BSAP and the, the new regional MSP roadmap. Uh, uh, could you comment on the, the role of that in uh, actually pushing countries to, to harmonize their uh, uh, environmental uh, integration in MSP? Do you? How strong uh, is this policy framework to, or what is what is needed in addition to, to the policy framework from, from your point of view? Uh, okay, so yeah, first of all, uh, Baltic Session Plan is the main policy agreement, how we're going all together to protect uh, marine environment. Uh, we are very happy that uh, marine special planning is recognized there as one of the instruments. And, uh, um, of course, we clearly understand that it, uh, marine special planning uh, can deliver to all the all the environmental goals. So it's only the one of the tools. Uh, on the other hand, we also well know that uh, plans, um, special plans, quite differ between the countries. And this is also not a secret. So somewhere they are legally binding, somewhere they have a recommendation status and so on. We are actually uh, now, as I have already shown, uh, have passed only the first cycle, the first step. Uh, but this is a huge step. So these plans have been drawn, designed by all countries and all, all, all countries. So just some countries are in final step. Uh, now the next step i think if we speak about this environmental side for also we re it, it's clear that uh special plans they have not they have many other goals not only to protect the environment i think it can be so to say the um, uniting force for all countries in implementation and uh create building knowledge base for the next side and uh, I suppose that environmental goals uh, described in the Baltic Action Plan, they uh, they might be a driving force for coherence of this and common understanding of the ro uh, roles of the um, maritime special plans uh, to contribute to the protection of the Baltic Sea marine environment and um, achieving good environment status. And also I would just like to mention that here we also uh, a lot we speak about the love between MSFD and MSP, but it works only for the EU member states. We also have Russia and we have already discussed that in many uh, other, for example, uh, in many other um, regional sea conventions, 
countries uh, which, so to say, bound by different policy framework, they have severe difficulties to identify uh, common environmental goals. Here in the Baltic region, despite we have a group of countries uh, bound by the EU legislation and Russia with its own legislation, but these two kind of group of countries or two policies, they are united by Baltic section plan, which identify for them common uh, goals. And this helps also develop this coherent set of American special plans involving all participants and what yeah, actors in the Baltic Sea region. Is it the answer? <laughs> yes, well, thank you very much, Dimitri. I think it's a uh, uh, very important point to, to actually highlight that uh, the BSAP and the roadmap are for the, all the Baltic uh, states, so uh, not only European ones. Uh, could you perhaps uh, comment on uh, this uh, MSP work group, uh, the Helcom Vasab group, which uh, um, which is quite unique, as I, I know it, and uh, uh, working a bit more on the policy level, but still uh, uh, kind of practitioner policy level, uh, and the role of that group uh, in relation to to uh, to the environmental integration. I think you you mentioned it already that uh, that group. In, isn't only focusing on environment, but also on any other use of the sea in, in related to MSP. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, actually, <laughs> I'm responsible for coordination work for three groups. Uh, and for example, the main pressure group, which is purely environmental, uh, dealing with the land-based sources of pollution. So uh, consisting of environmentalists, we are speaking about the environment protection, and this is the only point, and so to say, our beacon in the group work. This is the group of a bit different nature. <laughs> it's, uh, it has a broader vision and uh, it considers many various policies. So, uh, and integrate them and learn uh, how to uh, make peace between all those and avoid any conflict between these policies. I think this is the great development and working for almost already seven years with this group. I can see fantastic uh, progress. On the other hand, uh, we found we, we managed to develop common language and uh, common understanding. This is a very efficient group, despite uh, of integration of different um, representatives of different uh, policies and different uh, experts. But we are still a bit lacking of um, uh, practical steps and practical uh, guidelines, practical recommendations for the whole uh, region. I think this is the future of this group and it should be more and more practical, but it is clear understandable. We were in the first step. So countries had to lay a basis, a basement for their work, draw first plans. Now this is the next step. I think uh, there will be much more focus paid on the details, on practicalities, on technical aspects. And I'm so much looking forward to the uh, further development of these um, guidelines on ecosystem-based approach. And Jan, I hope so much that uh, Sweden will play <laughs> remarkable role there. <laughs> so with a lot of uh, work experience in this respect, and these guidelines will make a step from like a, a more or less theoretical background to practical recommendation. What does it mean in how countries should do that? Thank I'm, you very much, Dimitri. Uh, Thank you. We move to, to the biodiversity strategy now, and Panina and Rico. And uh, uh, I thought it was really interesting when you mentioned these the figures of 20 billion euros a year for biodiversity. Would that be a possibility to link to uh, MSP, or do you have any comment on that to actually link the spatial dimension of MSP? Uh, or how do we merge environmental management with marine spatial planning? Uh, yes. <laughs> I can try, but actually <laughs> it's taken from the strategy. And I think if the commission would be the right uh, 
to answer on this because uh, looking at the, it's still uh, in a uh, in a uh, in a phase the whole strategy. So uh, now it's in the, the commission is uh, asking uh, the member states about their views how to and this is the EU but then every country member states will have their own and how they will uh, put this uh, in in reality and uh, what is included so it this is still in a you know stage so uh, and looking at the, all these actions so I, I can't say at the moment what will be, but there's a lot of uh, different actions in these, both in the terrestrial part and the sea part. So, but the funding, I think uh, it's through like the EU funds, like uh, Life, uh, EMFF, and other interreg and other, and also perhaps to use also private, as it said, private funding but how to you to use it so yeah it's a good question that should be actually <laughs> but yeah, Rico, do you have any uh, visionary idea about that about the funding uh yes please more funding uh that's the, <laughs> the vision uh but uh yeah i mean it, it's uh i mean if we really want to be ambitious with, with the biodiversity strategy, which uh, I think that we should, considering the state of the biodiversity is so alarming. And so it really requires a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, research and and, um, and and also technical development of really finding the, the, uh, the solutions uh, uh, at sea and 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 especially in, in the Baltic Sea, if you think of that, which is a semi enclosed uh, in many respects connected sea, and 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 I think that there we should also look at the the whole uh, regional sea level too. Uh, where some countries have have uh, rather small sea areas actually to plan and 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 to protect, and so we really need to have look at the whole whole regional sea level. And uh, and of course, in, in the Baltic Sea Action Plan, there is the same 30 by 30 uh, goals. They are taken up in, in in the in the draft Baltic Sea Action Plan. So, so of course, that discussion is already going on. That we should really look look this at, at the regional sea level. Uh, but there's also more opportunities than than together to achieve. And, uh, and of course, the the EU biodiversity strategy, the 30% and 10%, it's, it's for the whole EU. It's not a national target as such. But there is a discussion on, on regional considerations. And then obviously, Baltic Sea, uh, you know, would, would be very uh, sort of natural region to look at. Uh, in, in some respects, the, the eco, ecosystem dynamics can be seen as a if not covering the whole sea, but at least uh, several countries' sea areas. And and that's also something that, uh, of course, there's already a lot of research going on, but still, I think that there's a lot to do, uh, especially with these connections between, uh, for instance, if we have a network of protected areas, the connectivity and uh, and all that is still, uh, still uh, uh, missing, and, uh, and also adding the climate change and, and possible uh, spatial changes uh, caused by that, and 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 so it, it's very complex uh, a field to cover. And then, uh, then of course, regarding MSP, then then that's uh, I think that uh, uh, even though MSP is not uh, the process to designate protected areas, but it really has an uh, uh, integral role, especially in this connectivity thinking that. Uh, uh, and and it is bringing all the sectors together, so that so it's not only about planning protected areas, but it's planning uh, planning across sectors and across countries. And uh, yes, so we need more mm. money for for having <laughs> having the answers. But thank you very much. Actually, now we it's uh, uh, five o'clock or six o'clock six o'clock in some countries, and it's about time to to wrap up. Uh, this workshop. Uh, we have uh, 
talked about uh, the policy framework which we have and the, which is pointing in the right direction. We've also discussed uh, uh, progress and some gaps which we will have to address uh, in the future work when we evaluate uh, the current MSPs. And we've also linked it to the biodiversity strategy, which uh, may increase the, the environmental targets and make it more specific. Uh, uh, but ex exactly how we link it to MSP is perhaps, perhaps something we have to uh, discuss further. Uh, we also had the idea of all of this perhaps uh, may lead to more prior, prioritization in the MSP and uh, stronger plans or we, we actually set limits uh, in some areas for for different users which probably is done already but could could be more explicitly perhaps with that i'd like to thank all the uh, presenters and uh, the participants in this workshop and uh, i hope you've had an interesting and a good time uh, now we're having a break for an hour and then there will be uh, more informal stuff, so uh, don't miss out. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Thank you.